that committee. Um, I think uh, we're going to go through uh, some procedural stuff. Uh, the, the chair, Councillor Pelleschi, is dealing with illness, and uh, our prayers go out to him. And uh, I'd like to pass it over to uh, to our uh, our city clerk. <coughs> Through you, Mr. Acting Chair, um, just to advise the committees, the committee, sorry, that uh, a couple of uh, changes to be um, considered as part of the approval of the agenda. Um, the first is just a procedural motion to ratify Councillor uh, Medeiros to serve as chair for the purpose of this meeting. Uh, he was vice chair appointed by council at the first half of this term, but uh, council this this second half of the term did not uh, formally ratify a vice chair, but Councillor Medeiros has been functioning effectively as a vice chair since uh, for this latter half of the term. As well, um, there would be an added item um, from the chief audit executive, and that's for Rusin, that she wishes to introduce her key staff uh, members, and that would happen after the consent motion is considered, or after consent is considered. Uh, and thirdly, um, with the indulgence of committee um, and in consultation with the chief audit executive, there is a recommendation that the order of business be varied on today's agenda, and I'll go through the proposed order. Um, first would be after um, consideration of the consent motion, if there is one, and after Feruzan's introduction of her key staff, committee would go move into closed session at that point in time to deal with the two closed session items, which are uh, 10.1 and 10.2. When committee and closed session would occur up on the sixth floor committee room. After closed session is completed and committee reconvenes back in the council chamber here, um, the proposed order of business would be to proceed with item 4.1, which is a delegation from Kevin Travers, KPMG, and the related item 6.1, which is the report from staff on the KPMG audit plan for fiscal year 2017. After those items are completed, the recommendation is that item 5.1, building permits uh, audit report, be completed, followed by 5.2, the library operations audit report, 5.3, the corporate fraud prevention hotline update, 4.3, which is a presentation from Feruzan on the 2017 summary of completed audits and recommendations. Item 5.4 would then follow, which is the quarterly status of management action plans. Then followed by item 5.5, the internal audit work plan for 2017-2018. That to be followed by item 4.2, which is a presentation from Feruzan on the internal audit budget. And finally, item 5, or excuse me, 4.4, which would be a presentation from finance regarding the modernizing financial processes, policies, and SOPs. And that's the proposed order in consultation with the Chief Audit Executive, Mr. Chair. Thank you, City Clerk. Um, I guess there will be a test at the end of uh, the meeting to see if you remember the order. Uh, Councillor Gibson? Um, um, just, that was confusing. I have no clue what you just said. I was trying to follow as it going along, but it was too difficult. So when we get to each one, can you just let us know what one we're on? Or maybe somebody can print out a read that revised order before we come back up in camera. We at the region, that's what we do when they, they change me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess uh, we need someone to move the motion about me chairing for today. And to vary the order. And to vary the order and have, add Frozen's item. Moved by Mayor Jeffrey. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. So our next order of business is uh, any declaration of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Nope. Uh, consent? There's nothing in consent, and I guess I'll hand it over to Farouz to introduce your team. <coughs> Hi, good morning, <clears throat> through the chair. Um, I just wanted to introduce our Office of the Internal Audit staff. <clears throat> First, I'd like to introduce Joan Ugwu, who joined the city October 10th, 2017, as a senior advisor. She's here on a 14-month contract. She has <clears throat> joined us from Fort McMurray, Alberta, where she spent four years at the municipality of Wood Buffalo. She has 12 years of experience working in the public sector, including ministries of the British government, <clears throat> as well as Trade Union Congress and the Ministry of Transport. Also, Gail Constantine joined us on the same day, October the 10th, 2017. She has 20 years of audit experience across a diverse range of organizations in public and <coughs> private sector. 
in Canada and internationally. She's worked with various ministries, the Government of Ontario, City of Toronto, as well as doing some audit consulting in Abu Dhabi. <clears throat> I'd also like to introduce Sabrina Cook, who has joined us September the 5th, 2017. She has joined us as an Administrative Services Coordinator for our office. <clears throat> She has mostly worked in not-for-profit organizations such as the Norwegian People's Union, uh, U sorry, Norwegian People's Aid, UN agencies, Doctors Without Borders. She has a background in international affairs and has been very helpful with research and report writing for our office. Lastly, I'd like to introduce Swati Tanija, who has joined us May the 29th, 2017, as a senior advisor. Prior to joining the city, she was with Loblaws in the Internal Audit Department, and she comes to us with seven years of audit experience. Wow. That's uh, quite the, the diverse international experience. It's fantastic. Welcome to the corporation. Um, I guess now uh, we'll have a motion to move into uh, in camera. Um, can I get a... Read the two items. Oh, say, so, and the two items are items 10.1, the security of the property of the municipality or local board or local board and item 10.2 .2, the security of the property of the municipality or local board can I get a motion moved by Councillor Dillon all in favor carried thank you so I'll see you guys up in five minutes okay ten minutes so it will be 937 so it'll be exactly uh, quarter to 11 quarter to 10 for information for information but no direction was given uh, we go now to our delegation I'd like to invite mr. Kevin Travers partner from Key KPMG, and will talk to us about the audit plan for the 2017 fiscal year. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to speak to the audit planning report. Um, this is the first of two formal communications that we have with this committee, the second, of course, being the findings report. So when we've completed our audit, uh, we come back and report, uh, I think it's late May, to this committee, uh, depending on the date of when it's scheduled. Um, that communication will include um, all of the results of our audit at that point in time. I'm going to speak this morning to, I'm not going to do a page flip per se, but I'm going to do, let's see, if, if this, oh, here we go. I'm going to hit what I believe to be the, the key elements or the highlights of the document itself. Uh, I'm certainly happy to be stopped as I'm proceeding and respond to questions as I go, or to respond to questions at the conclusion of the formal part of the presentation. Uh, from an overall uh, executive summary standpoint, um, our team is comprised of individuals who have been part of our team in the past. Uh, I think we have one or two new people, but it's largely the same team. So we've got a high degree of continuity and familiarity with the city's operations, including at the most important level, and that being at the senior levels of our team. So our partner and senior manager are the same individuals who have been on the audit for a number of years. Our audit materiality has been set at a number that's uh, at $19.4 million. That sounds like a big number. Uh, it's a number, and there's uh, additional details later in our report, but it's a number that's derived uh, and following the standards that have been set for uh, setting our audits, but it's derived based on your own financial results and the size of the city itself. Um, I always pause when I talk about materiality just to say and to give you the assurance that it doesn't mean that we ignore transactions below that amount, and that's hardly the case. Uh, I think for those that have been involved in the past, and I think that includes everyone here, uh, you've seen that we've reported on numbers far less than that number. What that number simply means is it's a number that if we had an uncorrected difference, which approached that number, I would have a difficult time signing an unqualified audit opinion. Um, it has always been the case, working with the City of Brampton, that had we, or when we've encountered any differences, that management has um, booked those differences. Uh, but we will report any differences, both corrected and uncorrected, when we report back to you in the spring. Um, when we look at audit scope, uh, you'll see reference to there's some terms that have uh, defined meanings within an audit uh, standard, or, uh, an audit setting. So you'll see something called non-significant components. Uh, the City of Brampton is considered to be a group audit, meaning that there's more than one audit that takes place as part of this engagement. Um, the Brampton Public Library Board and the, and the BDDA uh, are not uh, insignificant in any stretch, but they're not material to the City of Brampton. But they do have separate standalone uh, financial statement audits. So this scope just says as part of our engagement, we also do standalone audits of the library. Um, and uh, Downtown Business uh, Development Association. Um, so they have their own separate standalone audit opinion, even though the results are also consolidated within the city's results as well. Um, you'll also see on this slide here, in terms of the audit approach, reference to fraud risks. 
uh, one relating to revenue recognition and one related to management override of controls. I also always pause when I refer to this slide because I want uh, everyone to understand that those are presumed fraud risks. So it's not as if we believe them to be particularly elevated in the case of the City of Brampton, but whenever we're performing a financial statement audit, we're required to presume that these risks exist. So these are the planned procedures that we have um, in, in place in order to mitigate these risks to an acceptably uh, low level. When we report back in the spring, we will report specifically on the results of these procedures. The next two slides speak to, at a very high level, um, what our planned approach is for the more significant captions uh, and elements within your financial statements. Uh, this was the slide I referred to earlier in terms of how the materiality uh, value is uh, determined. Uh, I've mentioned myself and Anna have been part of the team for uh, a number of years, so these are the more senior levels of contact uh, for the team. And I think um, this, just, this slide just speaks to the timing of when we'll be here in terms of the cycle itself of the audit. And the remainder of the document are appendices. The only thing I'd point out in terms of um, perhaps uh, current developments, uh, the Public Sector Accounting Standards Board is the board that is responsible for setting the standards that you follow in terms of preparing your financial reporting. There are no developments or changes which will impact your 2017 financial statements. There are some other items on in the horizon. I don't believe that there's anything that would have any significant impact on the city's financial statements, but there are some items that are being uh, planned to be implemented in future periods. So that's really the formal part of the presentation this morning, and I'm very happy to respond to any questions you may have. I see. Questions, comments? No. Oh, uh, Mayor Jeffrey? Quick question. A lot of when we read our audits and where we need to modernize and become a future ready city are hampered by the fact that so much of what we do at the city currently is still done manually. How much of that uh, how much of that makes it a challenge for you to audit the books that we have? Um, through the chair, um, it's a terrific question. The response would be a, a, a quite a lengthy response. I wouldn't say that it makes it difficult. We plan our procedures according to the controls that you have in place. Um, and in some cases, we don't rely on the controls because in something like that, it's easier for us to just do substantive audit. So what we, we'll look at the underlying values that are within your reporting. We'll look for the source documents that tie directly to those items based on a sample basis. If there were more automation, in some cases, it would be easier for us to audit, audit because we could rely on some of those controls. So it's difficult to quantify what the particular impact is from our audit standpoint. And I'm sure that uh, Faruzan could comment similarly on some of the areas that she audits, that things if controls are different, she would have a different approach as to how she would go about compare, completing her audits. I just know that we're, we're, it keeps coming up, and I know that we're trying to change it and modernize it. And I just, I'm guessing that it has uh, an impact on the time it takes you to audit and the paper trail is is still there's still a lot of paper at the city which I think uh, uh, there's lots of different layers that make it longer to do that audit so I'm I'm guessing that hopefully will be easier to audit in in the years to come that it'll be more automated and there'll be more online uh, forms that uh, our public fill in and pay their bills by but I at this point we're still struggling in that transition. So I just wondered how it impacted what you did. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, can I get a motion to receive the delegation? Uh, moved by Councilor Moore. All in favor? Carrie, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do I have to bring the item 6.1 as well? Yes. Okay. Uh, so item 6.1, are there any questions or comments? No, moved by Councillor Dillon. All in favor? Yeah. Carried. Thank you. Um, so now we go over to item 5.1, building permits audit report. Are there any questions or comments? Mayor Jeffrey. Um. I guess my questions relate to, I, I, don't, I don't know if they're even questions. They're currently, we're pretty heavily reliant on manual processes. And I guess my, my question is, when we are more automated, will we be uh, more flush with revenue? Because I'm wondering if the automation, 
can help with the revenue. <laughs> yeah, I have a few questions. <clears throat> Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, Madam Mayor, could you clarify the So I, I guess the question was, uh, a lot of, uh, there's a fair amount of revenues that go through the building department. Um, there are. $17.3 million. And I know that we're coming up for an upgrade, but it seems like when I read the report, we're still heavily reliant on those manual processes. So I'm wondering, it, should we get to that on-life, self-serve, ideal, good customer service? Will Is there anticipation? that we will make more money? Because I'm guessing with the manual process, we're still prone to human error. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that is correct. And unfortunately, there's not uh, really a 100% way to eliminate that human error. Even if we uh, decide to automate the fee calculations, uh, it, it comes down to, at some point, somebody will have to enter <coughs> you know, a structure type uh, that corresponds with the fee in the bylaw into our Amanda system. And, and so there still uh, exists the potential for human error um, <coughs> in the instance of the point that was pointed out in the audit. Uh, again, it was between a, uh, I believe the charge that was charged was for a townhouse versus a stacked townhouse. And it was a pretty, uh, a pretty simple error to make. But that, that error wouldn't be eliminated by the automation necessarily because somebody would still have to enter that into the system. However, we do expect that there would be, in the short run, uh, an uptick in the revenue for, uh, for building permits, simply from the fact that it will be easier to access our services, easier to apply for building permits, uh, and therefore make it much less of an onerous task you know, for somebody to come into our department to apply for a permit for a deck or a shed or something something relatively <laughs> trivial uh, that they could do from the comfort of their own home in the evening or on the weekend rather than, you know, coming to see us on an afternoon or a morning. And uh, so so with the ease of service or the customer uh, service-oriented um, structure, we would see a, a, in the short term a rise in the permit revenue. The, just based on volume, correct, based on volume. But um, again, as we start to run out of our developable land, 65% uh, 60, of the revenue that we generate right now is from, uh, from that production residential housing. And so when we start to hit those uh, outer boundaries of, of that growth, uh, our revenue will probably take a downturn uh, and then we'll start to see a focus on uh, the infills and the high-rise residential and uh, so we're going to, our services will change a little bit from that outward growth to the infill and uh, we'll have to restructure a little bit to accommodate that. And, and we've already started building the structure of the organization around what's expected, you know, 10, 15 years down the road. So by the time we get there, we'll be, we'll be well positioned uh, to receive that. So through you, Mr. Chair, I also um, was concerned about the high demand that we put on the 18 staff and the uh, high overtime, high loot time. I'm, I guess I'm worried about the staff and the burnout level, and I, I haven't gotten to this part of my budget, but is there any changes to the staffing that you foresee in order to manage this uh, continued pressure uh, on your staff? Through you, Mr. Chair. So we, we've asked in uh, 2018 for an additional five staff Four would be uh, dedicated to uh, second unit task force. Uh, one would be uh, another senior plans examiner, and that would assist in the uh, the changing structure types that we're seeing. So the, the, with the focus on things like Atlas Healthcare, uh, potentially a new hospital, the university, those larger types of projects would have uh, would be uh, served by that senior plans examiner, and then. Uh, if we can, if this second unit task force is successful um, through this budget cycle, then that would alleviate a lot of the pressure, I think, on, on our current plans review and inspection staff because those projects are, um, how do I say this? They're very resource intense. They're um, more so than any other project uh, 
that we have. I would say there's more time spent dealing with a homeowner applying for a second unit than there is for somebody applying for uh, you know, a new high school. It's the amount of time spent at the counter, trying to walk them through the process and explain how the drawings are done because everybody's trying to do this themselves. Uh, you know, it, it's very resource intense. So I think that will alleviate a lot of the pressure on those those people. We've also in 2019 asked for an additional two staff members um, for, for the very reason that you've seen. We've got uh, a lot of overtime um, being put in by our staff in order to meet our legislative time frames. Um, so the legislative time frame requirements are one thing, but also the service level's expectation of that was a 10 to 30 days response time is, uh, so I'm glad to hear that the additional staff are in your, your uh, planning. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the um, fee calculation manual and the addendum and the disputes? So you've changed the process, but now there could be more disputes because the paperwork isn't there. Is that so have you resolved this issue so that it doesn't become uh, more problematic? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, what, what we intend to do, Madam Mayor, is, is um, we, we have revamped our, our addendum to provide uh, better opportunity for clarity uh, as it goes through the process as it exists now in that very manual state. Uh, we are working with IT right now in upgrading the, uh, the Amanda system to uh, a version 7, which is essentially uh, four versions ahead of the version we're operating in now. It's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very long project, but I expect that sometime in uh, early 2018, I'm thinking it's going to be spring, that we'll be uh, launching onto that, uh, that new platform. Uh, once we have had a chance to play around with that a little more and understand how the process will work, we will be moving to uh, populating those, uh, those fees into the Amanda system so that the manual calculation necess won't necessarily be there. It'll just be picking from a list of what applies to this particular scope of work. Um, the only other thing that surprised me was uh, the online electronic notification. Um, so that's not a requirement through the province, but we could ask for that email. I guess I'm, I'm trying to think we need to stop sending things out through Canada Post. We need to be, we want to be future ready. Last time I checked, most people are using email. So we've got to find a way, even if it's, if it's certainly not in the provincial uh, requirements, maybe we need to just go and uh, approach uh, the province to say this needs to be part of an upgrade to uh, legislation that we can be proactive on this one. So yes. if my office can be of any help in that regard, that we've got to make your life easier. It's getting harder and harder. And I worry about all the other customers we have. And I realize the homeowners can be labor intensive. Uh, be, and when they're not happy with your decision, they come and talk to us. So it, it is very labor intensive. So uh, we've got to find ways to uh, certainly make online payment easier and online notification and automating as much of this as possible. So I'm, I'm supportive of that. If there's some way that we or my office can help you, I think we'd like to do that. I appreciate that. And, and we'll certainly reach out to you if we, if we do hit a roadblock. We, we have, uh, it, just to put you at, at some degree of rest, we have uh, immediately moved to issuing those notifications by email. And then we send out the, the paper copy to make sure that we've covered our legislative obligations. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at scaling that back to just the email. But if we if we do run into a roadblock there, I'll certainly reach out to your office. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank right. you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Miles. Thank you. So today, <clears throat> today, if someone wants to apply for a building permit, they can't do it online. They have to do it at the counter manually. And every time they check in, they have to check in manually over the phone with someone. Through you, Mr. Chair, that is correct. Right now it is a completely manual process, although we are looking at launching, uh, I believe we go into uh, test actually tomorrow morning um, on the new uh, Brampton Maps, um, the, the, I think they're calling it the GeoHub, uh, but the new version of Brampton Maps. Uh, so we're testing, we've been working with GIS to uh, 
populate as much information as, as we can outwardly so that at least they can, uh, by the end of this year, people will be able to log in or go on to uh, Brampton Maps online and see the status of their applications, uh, see the status of their inspection results. Uh, but until we're uh, up and live with the version 7 of Amanda, we're unable to initiate the online application process. We have to get our um, our database, uh, our, our programming updated first so that we have that uh, solid foundation and then we can move forward with developing our online presence in a more robust manner so that e-commerce is a very uh, large part of where we intend to go in the next three years and we're certainly focusing a lot of uh, efforts and resources in, in going in that direction. Uh, but in the interim, uh, as much as we can, we're populating information outwardly so that by the end of this year you'll at least be able to log in and see the status of the application and the inspection results. But in terms of submitting the application, uh, currently it's, it all has to be done on-site. Why? <laughs> Sorry. No, it's it's a valid question. It's to be honest with you, and I don't know how to say this other than we're uh, we're about ten years behind in the use of our technology, and uh, we're we're trying as hard as we can to catch up. Wow. Okay. It, it's uh, that's left left me a little bit speechless. Um, this year, um, through. Um, a, a permit application, we found that there was inconsistency between rules and regulations that the municipality have in regards to um, water mains, water meters, hooking up to water meters, between what the building code says, what the City of Brampton requires, and then what the Region of Peel requires. There was, there was a, a big inconsistency that um, needed to be rectified. I don't know if there's only one instance of this or if we're finding that there's more of these kinds of in inconsistencies. Certainly, I'm finding through building permit and site plan applications that the city and the region aren't working very well together. So I just, I wondered, I know um, I had to have you and, and Mr. Petushka intervene on behalf of a resident, and I just want to make sure that we're addressing some of those issues. So could you um, speak to that? I can certainly speak to that. Through you, Mr. Chair. So I want to say about four weeks ago now, um, myself and Lillian McGinn sat down with Carol Clark and Andrea Warren at the Region Appeal and uh, we discussed the process in general and what the uh, what our regulations require and, and what their standards are and uh, we, we've certainly <clears throat> we've come to an agreement that we need to work more closely together and we are in the process of, of uh, sharing information and we have um, we have received from the Region Appeal um, documentation around what their requirements are in terms of, of the servicing when you are replacing uh, a dwelling. And we've included that now in our application information and our handouts to the public so that the public is made aware um, up front very early in the stage what the regional requirements are. I do still have an obligation uh, through the Building Code Act to issue the permit when all of the regulations have been met in the Building Code. Um, but the region understands that, and uh, I think that now that we're working to proactively initiate that contact with the region, uh, I don't think that we're going to run into the same issues that we did at uh, Goodwood, which I believe is the resident uh, that you're, you're speaking of. And we, we have gone through our, um, our applications for new dwelling units for those infill projects and identified uh, three others that could potentially fall into that same trap and we've reached out to them in advance to make sure that the same issue didn't happen. So in your opinion, and it's just your opinion, is the is the regional requirements unrealistic and unnecessary and cost prohibitive? Uh, sorry, I guess we're, we're getting a little bit out of Again, the topic, uh, Councilor Miles. Okay, if you want to so, bring it back but, but the topic to the is report. when we're, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. through you, audit should, an audit of the processes is 
is important. But I have found that when our process does not um, intertwine appropriately with regional processes, we need to, we shouldn't have to deal with issues as we come upon them. We should know where there is a misalignment or a re, uh, or a misalignment. And in this particular case, I would like to know, and maybe this is, but I want to know whether or not the Region of Peel needs to, to make some changes to their process if we have the full responsibility and jurisdiction for building permit, we're meeting building code, blah, blah, blah. The processes should reveal that. So that's why I'm raising it here. And maybe we need an additional report that looks at this, and a, a, an in-depth look. But it's not good enough when, at the end of the day, we issue a building permit and the Region of Peel says, you didn't meet our requirements and it's going to cost you like a hundred thousand dollar retainer for X amount of years until you decide you might want to sell your house so yeah. that's that's the issue and I want to know that through okay. whether we need an audit or what we need to do we have to make sure these things are lined up councillor miles I would just suggest thank you for your comment but I would suggest that with the planning committee coming up at one you might want to raise that and give direction to staff to look at it I don't know if it's uh, a planning so committee issue or if it's an audit process. How many other things aren't aligning? We're certainly finding in a lot of issues they aren't aligning. Yes, CEO. Mm -hmm. Chair, yeah. We don't have the authority to audit the region appeal, but it's part of continuous improvement. I agree with the councillor. If you're seeing a mismatch, we need to look at it in building and, and you know, pull the regional folks together. Okay. So and and I think sometimes political intervention and involvement is necessary because if we're making decisions here, setting policy here, and we're setting policy at the region, we need to know and we need to make sure they're aligned. So thank you very much for that. I do appreciate it. And um, I think, I guess through you to Mr. Mr. Schlang, we, we really need to, if we have to invest resources, financial resources, in, in moving this forward, we have to do it. Um, so. Um, is the budget this year going to address any financial um, um, any financial resources needed in order to bring this process um, up to stuff? Yes. Three, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes, Councillor. We do we do have uh, investment lined up for uh, moving this automation forward and for investing in in online services. Okay. Uh, the building division has has invested significantly, as has the rest of the corporation. Okay. So we'll see these changes within the next 24, I mean 12 months? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm going to say yes. Good. They, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Miles. Uh, would you like to move the report? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Miles. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we go over now to item 5.2. A report on library operations audit. Are there any questions or comments? No. Anybody like to move it? Councillor Moore, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, our next report is the Corporate Fraud Prevention Hotline. Questions, comments? No. Can I get a mover to receive? Yeah. Councillor Moore, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item 4.3, presentation, and I'll hand it over to our uh, internal auditor. Through the, through the chair. This is just a one, uh, sorry, a four quarter summary of <clears throat> the audits that we had presented by quarter, including the overall report ratings and the recommendations by priority one, two, and three. And as you, as you can see, over the course of four quarters, we have presented <clears throat> 
53 recommendations, and as of November 2017, 30 of these recommendations are outstanding, which means that 23 have already been actioned by, <clears throat> by staff. Um, the distribution of P1, 2, and 3 is of interest. Um, I think it just depends on the types of audits that come through. We'll be monitoring that on an annual basis and uh, provide updates to committee. Okay. Is there any questions, comments? Yeah. Oh, Madam Mayor. Can you tell us about the red on the phone management? What, what's happening, what you're doing? So, sorry, through the chair, um, <clears throat> the mobile phone audit was presented in June, audit committee. The 14 P1 recommendations have already been actioned by management and have been completed. We will be doing a follow-up audit in 20, 2018. So these are, this is a phone management, is it across the corporation? Yes. And all 14 recommendations have been followed? We've, we, uh, so every quarter we follow up with management as to the status of those recommendations. Their feedback to us has been that they have all been completed and closed, and when we do our follow-up, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll validate that. Can you give me a sense of what the problems were, generally? Uh, sure, through the, through the chair, um, essentially the, um, the process of the phones was, uh, had not been established, and just overall the governance and uh, the process of... This is cell phones, right? Yes. <clears throat> is it long distance charges? Is it, what, how is it? I guess I'm trying to get a sense of the scope of this. Uh, through the through the chair, this was reported in June. Um, I'm trying to off the top of my head trying to remember. There were there were um, opportunities I think for um, for the department to look at. So uh, I believe it sits with IT and with finance in terms of the repayment. So we were looking at um, long distance charges and having phone plans in place. And uh, I believe management has started doing that piece of it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Um, so if there's no further comments, can I get a receipt, move a receipt, uh, Councillor Dillon, all in favour, Carry. thank you, thank you very much. Go on to item 5.4, quarterly status management action plans, are there any questions or comments? No, can I get a mover, Councillor Miles, all in favour, Carry. thank you. Item 5.5, .5, the on Internal Audit Work Plan 2017-2018. Any questions or comments? Nope. Can I get a mover? Councillor Dillon. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item 4.2, presentation. You're busy today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, through the, through the chair. Um, as part of the updated charter, internal audit charter and the terms of reference for audit committee, this is the first year that we're presenting the budget to audit committee. <clears throat> um, this enhances the independence of internal audit to have audit committee review and approve the budget. Um, it also provides audit committee with a, an evaluation feedback mechanism into the internal audit budget prior to final budget submission. So this slide just highlights um, the budget to date uh, according to 2017 uh, and the budget remaining. Just highlighting right now that there is um, there were a, a number of open positions, uh, which is why our budget on, la on the labor line was low. And we've been, as you know, this past year has been uh, a lot of change within our department. So we, um, we've been, mostly this is a timing issue in terms of getting, getting the, the office up to, uh, up to speed. <clears throat> uh, 
the three-year budget submission. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a flat year over year. Um, it, the labor component includes six FTEs. We are currently in the process of looking for an IT auditor, so that uh, position is still open. Uh, <clears throat> the forecast for the year end uh, is listed here with along along with the variance and again just the same comments as before. Okay. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? I believe I have a, a motion that we're going to project. For you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So, uh, Council has authorized the Audit Committee to approve the budget for the Internal Audit Division when it made its governance changes in September. So these are the recommendations this committee should consider. And if the committee does adopt these recommendations, then they will be sent to the budget committee meetings scheduled to start November 27th for consolidation with the other corporate recommendations for council approval on December 13th. Okay, moved by Councilor Miles. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. Uh, our next item of business is item 4.4, presentation oh, by Mr. Majid. Modernizing financial processes, policies, and SOPs. Yes, Bruzen. Through the chair. Through the chair. <clears throat> our last uh, audit committee, we did have an audit of employee expenses. And uh, as a follow-up, finance has presented this to CLT, I thought this was great news for the corporation moving forward in addressing some of those recommendations. And so I wanted to share, I wanted the finance team to share those, those um, updates with you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning uh, through the chair. Uh, just to kind of introduce myself, Zishan Majid, Senior Manager, uh, Accounting Services and Deputy Treasurer. Uh, and I have my fellow team member, Maya Kuzminov as well, uh, the Manager of Accounting Services. So again, just thank you for the opportunity to come here today and provide an update uh, in terms of uh, the work that we've been trying to do to modernize some of the financial processes, uh, policies, and uh, SOPs at the city. So just to get straight into the presentation, um, and from a background perspective, we knew that uh, to further enable and facilitate the city's transformation and, and kind of leading into some of the questions that were raised earlier, uh, we needed to assess the functional and operational components of the city's various processes. Uh, and from a finance perspective, we've received input from our internal audit uh, team uh, as they've conducted various reviews of uh, key financial processes during the year. Uh, we've received feedback from staff uh, as well in terms of some of the frustrations they were having, ha having from a day-to-day -day operations perspective. Uh, and we also made a commitment to council back in May uh, that as a corporate services team, we were focused on having the right people with the right tools, processes, and technologies uh, in the right places in order to lead this continued transformation at the city. And again, our ultimate aim is to make our organization more agile, more responsive, hopefully embrace innovation and drive more accountability. Uh, and the timing of our process reviews also tied back together with some of the other strategic initiatives such as updates to both the administrative and purchasing bylaws. Now, in terms of a strategic way forward, as mentioned, our initial focus was to take the feedback from our internal and external auditors, process owners, and employees, and use that feedback to help us prioritize our efforts on processes that we felt would have the most uh, significant and immediate impact. Our approach to modernization is with a simple mindset of developing user-friendly online forms that are making us truly paperless. Uh, and also on trying to eliminate redundant submissions and approvals wherever possible. And the tool that we're actually trying to use uh, to facilitate this transformation is called Agile Point. So just briefly a bit about Agile Point. Uh, it's an off-the-shelf enterprise workflow system that was acquired by our IT team through a formal RFP process. Uh, and it essentially is a software that allows the creation of online forms with an automated workflow. So you create whatever form you would like, and you can dictate the flow of that form or document throughout the organization and control how the escalation and progression of that form or document happens online. It's a cloud-based solution 
uh, and has easy integration with other city applications as well. Uh, it has built-in KPIs and dashboards so that at any point in time, you can see how many workflows are outstanding or at what level hierarchy in the workflow chain something has been stuck at or the time it normally takes for a workflow to progress uh, and so on and so forth. So the first process that we kind of used Agile Point for and, and are trying to develop is the employee travel and education reimbursement process. From a current state perspective, uh, it's a fully paper-based manual process with almost five separate documents that a employee has to fill out uh, and individually complete uh, from a pre-approval request form to a separate, a separate budget and meal spreadsheet. Uh, there are no minimum approval thresholds and pretty much all of the documentation requires director level approval. So obviously this has resulted in some frustrations with all the paper-based manual forms, different spreadsheets requiring manual input. Uh, and then all the pre-approvals needed uh, and further delays in trying to have everything done, approved and processed in a timely fashion. So that's the current state. From a future state perspective, using the Agile Point software that I was mentioning, uh, we are looking to consolidate all the forms into one online submission uh, and all done in a paperless environment. You can still attach receipts uh, and other documents to the workflow, but again, it's all through an online submission. Uh, we've moved the approval accountability to cost center leads. We've also introduced specific thresholds for pre-approvals. And again, all done using the workflow and the online tool. So as soon as someone logs in, uh, a lot of the information like their name, division, et cetera, is already pre-populated. Uh, we've built in edit checks so that the online form uh, will only allow you to proceed if you've kind of submitted the minimum documentation and completed it accurately. There will be email reminders to everyone along the approval chain so that nothing gets stuck in a particular uh, step or the person who's submitting gets reminders in terms of if they haven't completed it in a timely fashion. Again, our hope is that this will lead to improved processing times, uh, less frustration with the overall approval process, uh, and less follow-up needed from our accounts payable team. And hopefully we'll be able to monitor things more effectively and, and run metric reports uh, more accurately using the software's built-in capabilities. From a timeline perspective, uh, we've kind of already uh, developed the, the actual form itself. We're in the testing phase. Uh, there will be a report to Committee of Council on December 6th in terms of providing an update with respect to the policy and, and changing it to an administrative directive. Uh, we're looking at, subject to the approval by the Committee of Council and Council, we're looking at kind of communication and training in December and then trying to launch the online tool Jan 1, 2018. Uh, again, the second key process that we're trying to use the Agile Point uh, software is the delegation of purchase and financial spending authority form. Uh, just as a recap, the delegation of purchasing form uh, allows uh, the delegation of a, de a department head's purchasing authority to a director, senior manager, or manager. And the financial spending authority provides the framework or authority level uh, uh, details to who can actually approve invoices and payments. Um, Again, sorry, from a current state perspective, very manual, uh, fully paper-based. Uh, there are three hard copy forms that can be completed for the delegation of purchase authority and a one hard copy form for the financial spending authority. Uh, and both are kind of managed a little separately by the purchasing and finance teams. The thresholds across the forms aren't actually consistent. Uh, and the verbiage based on the feedback received is somewhat confusing sometimes to the extent that staff may not fully appreciate the authority that they are being granted or understand the responsibility associated with it. Also, if a person's role changes, uh, it is a very manual process to have the forms updated again uh, and go through all the rounds of signatures and approvals. This in turn from the feedback uh, that we've received creates a lot of frustration, confusion and redundancy in the levels and layers of uh, appropriate approvals uh, with the possibility of processing delays. Again, what we're proposing from a future state perspective and what we're working towards is trying to consolidate all of those two distinct processes and forms into one new online and easy to understand submission. Uh, we've created profile-based profile, profile -based views for the new form. So if you initiate the workflow, you can go in, choose the profile you're requesting. So for example, if I'm a senior manager, I go in and select a senior manager profile and the form will pre-populate what I'm expected to have in terms of an appropriate authority level. 
uh, and it'll be in line with the policy that's in place. So from a department head perspective, mm -hmm. he can quickly just review it, know that it, will, it is only the default uh, authority levels that a person can request, and that'll speed up the, <laughs> hopefully speed up the approval process. Uh, similar to the previous process, again, our hope is that it will just improve the overall um, uh, processing times and reduce redundancy from consolidating all these forms and processes into one distinct online form. From a timeline perspective, we've got the new form ready. We're just working with IT to have it implemented into the Agile Point software. Uh, we're looking to kind of update the purchasing bylaw in the new year as well. And hopefully once the purchasing bylaw is updated, we'll kind of finalize the online forms and hopefully aim to have it go live uh, Q2 2018. So in conclusion, again, just a special thanks to the accounting team and Maya, because I know there's this been a significant amount of time uh, leading up to this and, and successfully working with both IT and purchasing uh, and trying to kind of deliver on some of these online forms. Uh, and we know that we're changing a lot of these processes that have been in place for several years. Uh, and we may not get it right 100% to uh, kick things off, but we're hoping that by moving these things online and by kind of uh, being having the ability to have these uh, policy directives as administrative directives, it will allow us the capability to kind of pivot faster uh, and tweak these things uh, as we kind of roll them out in the future. I'll open that up to any questions. Great, thank you. I have nothing on the board right now. Once, twice. Can I get a mover? Councillor Gibson, all in favor? Okay, saved by the bell. Councillor Miles, please. I just want to say good. That was great. It's really, I mean, every time we're meeting, we're getting good news stories. We're seeing how we're doing things more efficiently. Um, and I, I just think you um, deserve to hear that. At the end of the day, we make the policies and we end up being responsible when things don't go right, but you carry the weight and this um, certainly is a really positive indication that uh, that you're listening to audit and that uh, you're moving yeah. forward. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Thank Moore. You. Councilor Moore. Thank you. Uh, the only comment I want to make is that we need to make sure we have enough resources in internal audit to add both human um, resources and talent to do the kind of auditing as we move to more of this across the corporation. Um, I mean, our in-camera session this morning, so and you've talked about hiring the the IT auditor. It really, really reinforces that if we're going to do business differently. We need to be able to have the accountability piece uh, ready to go. Uh, through the chair, uh, <clears throat> having an IT auditor actually allows us to do more continuous auditing, which is sort of the move forward and being a little bit more proactive and interactive with management. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. The report was moved by Councillor Gibson. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. <coughs> <coughs> Lastly, uh, we have a report here. Regarding the analysis establishing a permanent independent auditor general, or the, yes, CAO. If I could, Chair, I just wanted to go over the report quickly. Yes. So as you stated, we were asked, Joe Pintari and myself worked on this, we were asked to look at the potential of a permanent AG, uh, its benefits and cost implications. So if I, uh, I just wanted to state that, firstly, this new administration, well, it's not so new anymore, we believe in transparency and independence and accountability. If you recall, last September, we did uh, create further independence in the IA role by having a report to Audit Committee. And then in September of this year, Audit Committee uh, strengthened that independence with a charter and a terms of reference that really makes it more of a joint responsibility on, on the hiring and, and the um, promotion and firing of, of an internal auditor. Everything has to be approved by both Council and Audit Committee Council and the CAO. We also um, looked at a number of things. We looked at across Canada, but really in Ontario is more relevant to an AG role for Brampton. So we looked at um, those, what you're seeing is a trend of, uh, in 2010 there was six AGs in Ontario, now there's two. So two of the 444 municipalities that are not mandated to have AGs. The City of Toronto is mandated, legislated to have an AG. And they're the only city in Ontario that have both an AG and an IA internally. So we looked at some comparators. On page 
two and three, you really see the different powers of an AG. It really uh, focuses on those first five to six um, items on page two and three where they have different powers. Uh, number seven, we find that AGs do not um, do a lot of consulting and advisory services on continuous improvement on policy, uh, what you're seeing here. We also looked across Canada, and it does vary in the different provinces. So for the city of Brampton, it's there for information, but not as relevant as we discuss what's, what's critical for the city of Brampton. On page four, we really have, um, we feel that the model has been working very well. It's been a cooperative, collaborative approach with IA and our operating departments. There's been some, some critical improvements that you're starting to see and uh, over the last 10 months. And even uh, Standard & Poor's have commented how um, the transformation has improved some of the business controls going forward. Um, again, the AG tends to be in Ontario a bit less collaborative and more confrontational and adversarial. Um, and our role here in the city of Brampton, I feel, is a continuous uh, competitive advantage that we're really getting the IA to work transparently with council, but collaboratively with staff to improve the organization. And we have seen these improvements in the last 10 months in this role. We also feel that the culture that we've, you've asked me to promote and we're trying to promote in this corporation is more of a collaborative nature, teamwork approach that has been driving innovation. And we feel that this model that we have in place is the one that I would recommend we stay with. Okay. Thank you, CEO. Uh, Councillor Miles. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've given a lot of... Um, of thought to this report and and the recommendations and I guess having uh, sat around this table for for many years I think it's really imperative that members of council have confidence in the leadership of the um, of the staff that they hire and because how can we make decisions and how can we lead a, a city if we don't have the confidence in the people that we hire and designate to carry out responsibilities based on, on their specific skill set? Because after all, we're members of council. We're just ordinary people. That's what we're intended to be. We're intended to be the, the voice of the municipality. We're not in intended to have, intended to be experts in, in every service delivery area that, that we have, um, and, and in fact it would be impossible. So without that confidence that the, the leadership and the recommendations and the due diligence is being carried out by staff, I, I don't think we can do our job. What I can tell you with confidence is what I've seen over the last year in regards to our senior leadership team and uh, Feruzin, the kind of um, reports that you have brought forward to us, the work that you have done as our internal audit. I have so much confidence in your leadership as an internal audit, and I have so much confidence in our, in our um, leadership team that the decisions that you're making are for the right reason. And that's how it has to be. And nobody expects every, anyone to be perfect and not make mistakes. But certainly, we as a council have to have the confidence in our leadership team that the advice that you're bringing to us is good advice based on um, your, your professional um, designations, what have you. I believe that the municipality is far better served by an internal audit, an internal auditor, and a highly skilled internal audit team than we would with one, with one auditor general. I think that you have demonstrated to us in the last year that nothing, not, nothing is go is getting sort of past your eagle eye <laughs> in regards to 
in regards to the functioning of this municipality. So I I think that I think the members of council can can have the confidence that you're giving us the oversight that it's um, impartial. And I I can't imagine ever getting the kind of, of recording and the uh, reporting and the kind of oversight that we're getting um, from you and our internal audit team from an independent auditor general. So I fully support the, the recommendation in this report. And I want to commend you for the changes that you have brought forward um, and for the unbiased and sometimes difficult reports that you've, you've had to bring to us. Um, because some of them were, were revealing that we weren't getting the right kind of, of advice in the past. And I can tell you, sitting in our position, we, we may know that we're not all, we, we may know that the leadership isn't telling us what we need to know, but it's difficult to make those changes on a one-on-one. -on -one. But I, I just, I feel very confident um, that we're on the right road, and I, and I absolutely believe that this community would be far better served with our own auditor than with having a uh, an outside auditor come in on <coughs> on a one-off or or what have you. I mean that's the role of KPMG, and if we wanted forensic audit, we could get forensic audit. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Miles. So um, I will move the recommendations okay. in the report. Uh, recommendations are moved by Councilor Miles. Uh, Mayor Jeffrey. So I want to thank Mr. Schlein for bringing back the report. And um, I know uh, Mr. Patari worked on it. Thank you very much. Please don't take this as a, as a, as a, a negative. So I, 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 too, want to express my confidence in staff. And I think we're, we're in a better place. And I think... Uh, over the last year, I have seen improvement. But I recommended at the beginning that we have a permanent and independent Auditor General, and I still feel that that would be the right thing to do. So Mr. Schlang and I are on different sides of this issue, and I appreciate the argument that he brings forward. The Municipal Act allows municipalities to appoint an Auditor General who reports to Council and is responsible for assisting Council in holding itself and its administrators accountable for the quality of stewardship over public funds and for the achievement of value for money in municipal operations. Toronto has both, and if you read the papers these days, Toronto needs both. We are a city that wants to be future ready. We're the top nine in Canada, and right now six of the top ten cities in Canada have an independent Auditor General. That's Toronto, it's Montreal, it's Calgary, it's Ottawa, it's Edmonton, it's Winnipeg, it's Vancouver. I want Brampton to be on that list. And not just because I want to get there, but because I think that we saw the value of having an independent set of eyes come in in that first year we were in office when Jim <coughs> Carter came in to look at our books. I think there are times when the internal um, audit function of your, of your staff is busy, preoccupied with some of the internal activities of this corporation. And I would say that based on and what I see, they're very busy trying to transform this city and its functions into something more accountable and transparent. So the best example I can give is the City of Toronto had their Auditor General, um, they've actually now called in the police, but originally she uncovered some suspected examples of outside contractors bid rigging on city paving jobs to drive the price up. The city awarded 55 road resurfacing contracts worth $168 million. That works performed by private bidders who go through the city's competitive bidding process. There were inaccurate um, estimates by city staff, and a contractor was able to gain an extra $2.5 million from city contracts. 
The, re the newspaper clippings go on to say that city staff needed to be vigilant, monitoring, detecting unusual bid patterns, and that yet the audit identified numerous red flags of potential bid rigging by certain contractors in paving contracts. The audit that the um, independent auditor did identified significant control deficiencies and a lack of routine analysis of bid submissions and bid patterns. The audit also highlighted the risk of conflict of interest being between contractors and city employees. I'm not suggesting that happens here, but I think that there are times and there have been practices that are problematic, and we've heard about them. They found that 15 of the 55 road servicing contracts awarded between 2010 and 2015 were materially unbalanced, and the city could have saved nearly $2 million by ensuring accurate quality estimates in tender documents. I know Peter Wallace, the city manager at City of Toronto, he used to work at the province, and I called him about this a few months ago and said, does this make sense? Would you value the work that uh, an, an, audit, uh, an independent auditor does? He shared with me that this auditor was a pain in the neck, but boy, he's really glad she came on board because he said that there was a slavish devotion to the status quo at the city of Brampton and a culture of complacency. I don't know that Brampton is any different. We may be smaller than the city of Toronto, but we are tied to, well, we've always done it that way. In the, in the sense of what we've do, been doing over the last few months from a, a procedural perspective and a policy perspective, we're trying to change that mindset but when you are um, awarding contracts or doing business outside the city, there's a lot of money to be made if you're somebody who does business at the city. In the case of the city of Toronto, they awarded they award a billion dollars in public contracts for construction and repairs, including a hundred million dollars for road repair and maintenance. When you have big contracts like that, you're vulnerable to fraud, and that vulnerability takes place because people are more sophisticated than often our own staff are. The core thing is we need to be more sophisticated and that requires an investment. The auditor in the City of Toronto spoke about the $2.5 million in needless spending on small sample contracts. And she, she also uh, talked about the Charbonneau inquiring, suggesting uncompetitive bidding could it add as much as 30% to a government's contract, contact, uh, contract costs. Corporate transformation is really difficult, and certainly our CEO, Harry Schlang, has been trying to do that. It takes time to do that. It takes money to do it. And how we protect our taxpayers' interests is going to stay difficult. But I think we as a council have agreed that it's important to uh, put money in technology and talent. We discovered a lot this morning about the work that we do inside is done manually. The city audit, the independent auditor at the City of Toronto said she was also surprised to discover contracts submit bids only on paper. To do their audit, her staff actually had to borrow a van from the city clerk's department and drive to district offices, city district offices, collect paper records to develop spreadsheets that allowed them to analyze the trends and discover the signs of collusion. Her findings prompted the city to start switching to electronic bids. That's what we're about to do. And to find ways to automatically build a database. I think the city of Brampton is on the right path. I think we're headed in the right direction. But I think there's always room for improvement. The modernization of um, these documents and the database is going to help us as a city. I think that this city still needs the ability to have someone who is outside, not within the corporation, who can look at the activities of our city with new eyes, can look at trends, uh, finding ways to determine best practices, because based on what we've talked about this morning, our audit department and our leadership are busy with trying to modernize our existing department, some of which clearly was 
brought to council attention in the last term but wasn't acted upon despite their best efforts. So, Mr. Chair, um, I would like to move um, a different portion to the motion. I know that the that Councillor Miles has moved that the current audit structure be maintained, but I would like, like to add the words, therefore be it resolved that the audit committee recognize the efforts of the Office of the Internal Audit and its commitment to the overarching principles of accountability and transparency, and that the City of Brampton continue to support the efforts of the Office of Internal Audit. And further, that it be resolved that the City of Brampton also appoint an independent Auditor General for a fixed term of three years to provide even further external evaluation of the city's operations consistent with the operating model of larger progressive public sector entities that operate both internal audit and auditor generals and that the, no the noted financial resources be included in the budget. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Jeffrey. Uh, Councillor Dillon. Um, thank you. My mic is on now. Uh, I just have some questions of clarification from the from the report. Um, just general questions. Who is this to you, right? Who am I speaking to? To anybody? All right. um, so it said limited uh, justification can be made to suggest a deviation from uh, the city's uh, current uh, internal audit direction given its successes. I'm just wondering, can you just briefly list through uh, what staff feels the successes are uh, and if there's any room to build uh, on those successes? Through you, um, yeah, we listed a number of them on page two of, of number seven. Uh, so, so, I don't know what, it'd be 7.1.2. We listed a number of them there. Um, uh, 7.1.4. And the way we did the restructuring is we had a strong independent IA and then we um, consolidated a number of people in what we call service innovation. So they're working closely together. <coughs> and a lot of this modernization you're seeing in the last two, three months has been a combination. So for example, when we're developing a new process, they review it through Feruzan to see if it's audit proof and to make sure it stands the test of appropriate internal controls. So in a number of these initiatives in 7.1.4 and ongoing, we've been doing that. The reason why I say it doesn't justify um, moving away from the model is you'll, um, I was also asked to look at the financial implications. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking at this, I was looking more that you would just have what, an AG role and eliminate the IA role. And there would probably be a transition cost because an AG wouldn't accept the IA team. There would probably be some transition costs. And uh, so the financial implications of adding cost to the city uh, just didn't justify the increased benefit. Uh, I do believe that a number of the audits that the mayor talked about were going into a road resurfacing audit. Um, Ferguson's team has the capable of doing capability of doing that. She's also doing value for money audits, and in addition, she does what an AG doesn't do, and that's that advisory role. Um, do you feel that the an external auditor would limit the successes we have, or uh, even cause us to be to regress? Do you think there's any room that it could improve, or do you think that we're, we're satisfactory right now? Through you, Chair, again, um, through talking to the various cities across Canada, I, the whole point of the outcome that you want is a collaborative role and that you're trying to improve the corporation. And I would say the model we're using now is improving the corporation. Um, and I, I would, again, I just stand by that. Right. So do you think there's a uh, question, next question, is there a specific reason um, an auditor general uh, is mandated in Toronto and Winnipeg, et cetera, um, and, you know, why in Ottawa, in Ottawa and Sudbury have chosen to do so? Just contrasting Brampton to them. Yeah. The research that we've done, the provinces have a little different legislation. Nova Scotia, you know, through the Halifax Act, legislates that they have an AG. Alberta, the same. Um, so Ontario is quite unique that it's not legislated other than the city of Toronto. No, but what I'm trying to get at, sorry, um, is why, why Toronto? Why not other larger municipalities such as uh, you know, Brampton or Mississauga? Why aren't we legislated and why are they? 
Do you have the answer to that, Joe? <laughs> Through the chair, the City of Toronto is a is a very large and complex organization. It went through amalgamation where you had a number of different uh, you know, entities coming together. I recall uh, the City of Toronto as a client nine years after amalgamation calling SAP a new system. So mm -hmm. thinking about it from that perspective, when you have such a large organization, there, there is room and merit for both an internal audit to work closely in that, in that consultancy uh, style as well as still providing someone to have that oversight uh, to look for the, the, the examples of fraud that the mayor was looking at. It is a very large and complex organization, uh, a number of jurisdictions. You know, the fact that you have, even though it's, it's one municipality now, when you look at the, some of the broader relationships, even from a Lynn perspective, 10 Lynns overlap the city of Toronto geographically. So thinking about how the staff interpret its own legislation and policies and how they support all these different entities can be very complex. We don't have those same complexities here. Hence why it was mandated uh, historically that the City of Toronto have that. Generally through the Municipal Act, much like uh, in Alberta, there's generalized legislation saying a municipality has the authority to appoint uh, an auditor or city auditor. Uh, however, it's up to their discretion. Right. S same as here. And I just want to clarify, Sudbury and Ottawa do not have an IA. They, they chose just to go with an AG role. So okay. they, they do not have an internal audit function. They just have the AG role. So an external, they have yeah. an external. But, uh, so I understand that we might not be the size of Toronto, but uh, I think we're pretty similar to bigger than Sudbury, and I guess we'll, we'll be at Ottawa's size. Um, but do you know why, what their, their uh, reasoning was to go? Uh, with uh, the external? Through you, I, I basically, when I talk to the various groups, I, I basically talk to them and, you know, they have an AG role and they're living with the AG role and they're making do with it, both Ottawa and Sudbury. I t when previously in 2010 there were six AGs and it went down to two, so I talked a lot to Windsor on why they switched or, and it was basically to get more of a collaborative role and still get the capability in their IA, IA team to do all the other things that they're doing. Right. Um, so just in the report, it also says the Auditor General determines the work plan, whereas um, I guess internally the plan is reviewed and uh, approved by um, Council. And so, again, these are just questions that I have just for uh, clarification. Wouldn't you think that uh, an external audit uh, has a little bit less... Uh, Again, I have full faith in staff, but, uh, you know, to err is human. Uh, and, you know, external audit is less biased and might have less uh, political influence in it. <laughs> yeah, it's unfair for me to answer that question, because in some of the interviews we did, we, potential, they felt, potential they felt that the AG role had more political influence than, a, than an IA role. Mm -hmm. So it was vice, vice versa. I kind of heard both stories. Right, and, and again, I have full confidence in staff, but, uh, you know, I, I've heard, uh, uh, you know, one of the continuing themes in this council is to look back and say, you know, staff misled us over, for example, SWQ or staff did this. Uh, again, so, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to get some information on the, to contrast the internal and external. Maybe if the, you know, we had a, an external uh, auditor, maybe we could have avoided some of those things. So these are some of the clarifications that I'm, you know, just asking right now. Um, and so just in a nutshell, uh, if you were speaking to uh, the residents uh, of Brampton, just face to face, what reassurance uh, would you provide them, uh, you know, that staff recommendation uh, to an internal auditor uh, over uh, an AG or external one uh, is, you know, to the best benefit of the taxpayer? Like what reassurance would we give them? I would say that this council making those changes in the transformation are really unlocking, you know, providing much more independence of the IA function to council through audit committee has really ensured that independence and accountability. The, the charter, if you look at the charter and the terms of reference, have even strengthened that, that in no way can any staff, you know, um, adjust the IA's recommendations. They go directly to audit committee. Um, 
the reports are just reviewed, like just passed through by me to, to audit committee. I can't adjust any of those reports. Also the hiring and, and, and promotion and termination is all done through audit committee and audit council jointly with the CAO so it's more shared. So the independence is there and, and from, a, from a fulsom audit perspective, the IA role in Brampton has all the tools available to it that an AG does from value for money audit, you know, compliance audits. And also in addition provide a lot more consulting services, advisory services to improve our corporation. And at the same time, you're doing that at a cost that would be cheaper than bringing in a so AG for, role. Sorry, just for clarification, the internal auditor reports directly to council, not to the CAO. Is that correct? Reports functionally to audit committee, through right. to council, and then administratively to the CAO. Oh. So, if to the chair, if I can just ask, um, would it be possible to have uh, the mayor re just repeat, or maybe if you want to repeat the uh, the recommendations that? Because I think I'll, I'll read when it comes time to consider the motion. I'll reread. Okay, the, so if I, I I'll save my comments for the motion uh, when you reread it. Is that all right? I, I want to just get clarification. I wasn't. I didn't, yeah, I didn't hear we first it. we first have to deal with uh, receiving uh, uh, receiving the recommendations moved by Councillor Miles, and then after at that stage, then we can speak about. Then we put the motion. Is that correct? Because they're contrary to the other, right? Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Miles has moved the staff recommendations. <coughs> And if those recommendations carry, then the mayor's motion, as stated, would be deemed to be contrary. So, Mr. Chair, can I ask that it be separated then, and we can all vote in favor of the report, and then the second part is where we disagree. So the first piece is just the receipt of the report, right? So, yeah, through, through, through you, Mr. Chair, there's two recommendations in the staff report. Councillor Miles is moving. The first is receiving the report, and the second is sustaining the, the status quo, structural and functional relationship. So we can all vote for one, two, where I have, I have so, so, be so, close so the reason why I want to, I, I want to hear, and my apologies, I didn't, I want to just hear it again for clarification. So if we, if we will, let's assume that we all um, receive the report, there's potential because there's, you know, six people here that both could be, Okay. Let's uh, not deal with hypotheticals right now. No, I'm just just for clarification. Do you want me to reread the motion? Yeah, if you can. Okay. Um, I guess let me go through the comments, and after I'll be happy to reread the motion. No, if yeah, uh, if you read it now, then because I wanted to comment on it as well. Three, you, Mr. Chair. Yes. So, uh, even though a second motion's been placed, it really is held in abeyance pending the outcome of the first motion, which. Is Councillor Miles' motion to receive the report, and the second recommendation is to sustain the status quo in terms of the functional so, relationship. So, so debate on the second motion introduced by Council by so Mayor Jeffrey is not really before committee. Okay, so if if the time. recommendation um, fails, uh, the mayor's motion is on the floor. So that's when we, that's when yes. we speak on it, right? Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure I understand what the difference is. Can you explain to me better what the difference is between an, an internal and an auditor general? It's really um, counter Gibson on 7.1. Yeah, I, I got that, but it just doesn't really give me a lot of... <laughs> I, to me, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of difference. There... Tech, you know, from a corporation continuous improvement perspective, there isn't. The only difference is that the AG has more powers that are identified from one through six. And mm -hmm. they have, uh, they go to the press directly. They have the right to develop their own plan without consult consultation with council. Uh, so they have more powers to do what they need to do. But in the end, they don't do a lot of advisory services, a lot of consulting services that, that improve the corporation. So an IA does all the same things, plus the advisory role to help with continuous improvement, but they don't have those same powers So um, that are listed there. Okay. In a nutshell. I am, and that's part of that is what scares me is the press thing, because we all know how that can be twisted. Um, can we can we hire um, an auditor general at any time? 
We don't have to do it today, can we? Do we do it? What I'm fearful of right now, and I'll just throw it out there, is I see a huge change in the way we're doing things right now, and it's a breath of fresh air. Um, not not just in audit and a lot of things, but we're just here for audit today. Um, I'm really glad that we're back to um, just to correct something in the report. We didn't always have the internal auditor report to the CAO. In fact, I believe it was Lauren McCool who took it out of his office and put it in council's hands. And then I don't know how it got back to report into the CAO's office, but I'm really glad, Harry, when you came along, that one of the first things you said is, we, I don't want it. He said to us, we, we don't want reporting to you. You should be reporting straight to council. You told it. I remember you telling me that, and then you brought it forward to all of council that. That, to me, is a real uh, a great thing, and I think that's what we should do. I like that that um, the internal auditor can make suggestions to us and, and do things. But I would like to know, if we were to keep our internal auditor and hire um, an auditor general, what's the cost to that? Through you, uh, Chair, again, a, a permanent auditor general is what we were asked to look at. So a permanent auditor general, not just like you brought in an AG to look at some of the financials, you brought them in, brought them out. What you can still do even with an IA role. But a, a permanent AG, because they're, um, what I was looking at is I didn't think council would want both. You know, and I thought if you're eliminating the IA team coming in with an AG role, I felt that the transition cost would be about 200 k if you were to hire uh, both an IA and an AG role, your operating costs additionally would be, you know, the cost of that AG, probably some clerical support with that AG. So in excess of 200 k annually, I would suggest if you wanted both. And then, you know, would that be enough? Would they, you know, would they want more staff in the future? I don't know. Okay. Well, the mayor's back on, so maybe she can let us know that she's suggesting to have both here or not. So. Okay, and I mean it's a tough one. I really, I really liked where we're going with the um, internal auditor general. I like that we've used KPMG more to help us. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure where to go anymore with this, but I don't want to go backwards. And I kind of feel that if we throw that something else over top of the internal auditors head right now we might be going backwards and I certainly think if we didn't have an internal auditor we'd be going backwards so okay thank you okay thank you Councillor Gibson Councillor Moore thank you I I guess um we have to deal with one to get to the other but I I guess in listening to the mayor's motion what I understood was that the mayor was proposing we essentially keep the status quo and hire an Auditor General for three years, so we would have both. Um, and I guess, okay, I think first of all, I made some notes here. I think, um, given the example that the mayor gave on the roads contracts in Toronto, I think with a strong procurement uh, division, um, you know, there the and in cooperation with the internal auditor w would have caught that eventually obviously not soon enough but Toronto's a bit different they did go through a huge amalgamation they had the MFP computer scandal which really woke them up uh, in Toronto I don't know whether that was when the Auditor General or the City of Toronto Act I don't know how all those things intersected but you know there was a need to put in uh, greater control in Toronto with with the amalgamation and every municipality that made up amalgamation had their own processes and ways of doing business and uh, bringing that into the you know the current century was probably a huge challenge for them um, we've had an experience with an internal auditor here and I would say it was a huge disservice to the taxpayers in the city of Brampton um, the report at least in my opinion was nothing short of a big joke and uh, quite frankly, an insult um, to me as a member of council and uh, and to the taxpayers. Um, the provincial auditor did come in and there were things caught by our internal auditor on the OPR that was um, was not caught. 
uh, or identified by the provincial auditor. I don't think that um, we should be looking at this as one or the other. I think we should be looking at the duties and responsibilities and the benefits of both, and I think that our taxpayers are better served with an internal auditor. Uh, somebody who's familiar with the organization, somebody who builds trust and confidence as they move from one audit to the other within, uh, within that department where people, we've got the fraud, um, the fraud line, you know, that we're putting everything in place so that our in internal auditor can be flagged by staff or external parties in terms of whether or not they feel uh, something, mer or even members of council, if we see something that uh, doesn't make us feel comfortable, we can um, have the conversation about uh, the need for uh, taking a deeper dive into uh, practices in the organization. Um, so for me, this is about how, is our, how are our taxpayers going to be best served. Now, I've had an experience with the school board, uh, the Peel board, when they introduced an internal auditor uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. It was the best thing they ever did. I think they were the first school board at the time that introduced it, and that's still the model that they use today. I mean, the fact that uh, Toronto has one, I think we need to take that out of the mix altogether. You know, what prompted Ottawa or other municipalities to look at them and then withdraw? I think everybody has their own story to tell. Um, but I, you know, you introduced us this morning to um, some members of, new members of the team in internal audit. Um, it's very clear that there's uh, new and fresh eyes that are right here at home looking at things. So um, from my perspective, I, I, it's not a matter of trust and confidence. It's just a matter of, um, which of course is there. <laughs> you know, it goes without saying. But I think that um, uh, the internal auditor approach. Going back to the Auditor General, we do. If if there was a circumstance where the internal auditor did not feel that the level of cooperation was forthcoming from staff, it does. I, I would see that as a circumstance where somebody with more uh, power um, might want to, uh, you know, counsel uh, well, on the advice of either the CAO or the internal auditor. Um, would recommend an Auditor General, just like we did on the Southwest Quadrant. As I said, I don't think we were well served by that, but nonetheless, I think that if there, um, that is something that's always available to us. So if what the Mayor's proposing is that we put out an RFP and we hire an Auditor General or on retainer, like we do uh, an in-camera investigator, I think that that's a different um, that's a different scenario. I see that as not being, um, and, and, and over the three-year contract, we may or may not ever have to draw on those the Auditor General to come in, but at least we'd have one on record. If that's what the purpose of it is, I think that's a different conversation. But I think that the recommendations as presented before us today can um, pass and are not contrary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Mayor Jeffrey. Mr. Clark, is it not contrary? I mean, at this point, I'm being told it's not, but it, I actually think it is, because I think it's a decision that this council would be making. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, the staff recommendations which have been moved by Council Miles are on the screen, and the way I interpret uh, recommendation two is that the current audit structure be maintained, which is inherent with an internal audit function. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen with this council and the previous council, when and if necessary, a temporary appointment of an Auditor General, which the CAO has spoken to. Mm -hmm. um, and as I understand your motion, and I, I've read it once, but I'd have to read it's it again. It's a three-year term. Yeah, it's temporary. It's for I mean, a council can always determine whether they have it or they don't have it, but it's a three-year term. So that's what, it, that's what I'm suggesting, because I understand there's some discomfort. So I guess I, I think uh, Councillor um, Dillon came over and asked, is it, is it a hybrid? No, it isn't, because uh, Hamilton's model has a director of internal audit, is, audit is, already, is also the auditor general, which really doesn't speak to the independence function, which is what I'm really supportive of. 
And I just want to remind everybody, this wasn't my idea. This was the Ombudsman's idea. This was his suggestion in his report. This was his recommendation that a that an independent AG would be of value to this community or to this council. So um, as a result of that report, that's why this is here. This didn't come out of uh, out of the blue sky. This is the Ombudsman's, Mr. Dubay's recommendation. And I'm suggesting a three-year term. And that independence is really important. I think the internal audit department uh, function of our of our city is very important, needs to be doing the the work plan, it has already got approved by council, but an internal auditor general or a, a, an independent auditor general has a different function. And I guess the challenge is for here, the conversation that we're having seems like it's all or nothing and that, that the people who work here would be offended by having an independent auditor general. I'm guessing that if you're doing your job right, you, you welcome the transparency, you welcome the accountability. That, that you're, you're sharing that information. This is about our job of, of keeping um, our, our stewardship over public funds as accountable and as transparent as possible. Again, this is the Paul Dubay's recommendation to us, uh, a suggestion that he put out, uh, many of which we had already, uh, by the time he'd finished his investigation, we had already put in place and that Mr. Schlang had already reorganized the department so that, that the procurement is far more accountable and transparent. So at the end of the day, I, I think our staff are capable of walking and chewing gum at the same time. I think they can do work with uh, an independent auditor general if they're asked for information. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is, I don't want us to be in the same place as the City of Toronto where we discover that there are, there are things going on that shouldn't have gone on. I think that there are there is um, a trust and confidence in the corporation that is beginning to uh, be seen by the business community. But I'm interested in, in following recommendations of experts like the Ombudsman, like Jim McCarter, which we've done, which I think has translated into better um, internal ratings, better external ratings, um, more um, agencies that uh, uh, measure the success of municipalities. I want us to be cutting edge. I want us to be different. I want us to um, embrace um, that accountability, that transparency, and I think that this is a reasonable exercise. And I realize, I think from the very beginning, our CEO had 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 concerns about it, but I don't. I I think that uh, I think this would be uh, a good story coming out of the city of Brampton that we're. We, we are willing and able to manage that, that scrutiny um, by an external independent uh, body. And that's what the Ombudsman recommended, and that's why I brought it back here. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Dillon. Uh, thank you. Um, even though I, th I think um, you know, it was mentioned that uh, most major cities have uh, uh, an AG, I don't think it's, uh, even in, you know, any decision we make, I think it should be in the best interest of Brampton, even though we've been uh, comparing ourselves to Toronto or Sudbury or whoever it may be. But I think, um, just my opinion, we should be doing what's uh, uh, right for public transparency and accountability. And so, um, I, I, again, I'd like to hear the, uh, the motion again. And, uh, you know, I asked the, the mayor if it was, a hybrid model and um, you know in the report it says staff has undertaken the following research in prepping analysis uh, between internal and in in, in an AG and one of the things they listed was review of models that operates uh, operate across uh, Ontario and so Hamilton was um, one of the ones that you guys did research on and so they have a um, hybrid model but I guess they have an internal person is also the the auditor general, but also lists Markham as outsourced uh, an outsourced model where a third party is contracted to provide uh, AG services. If hypothetically, if we went to a um, or any municipality has a hybrid model where um, you know not like Hamilton where they have an internal and a, and a separate external, what is the 
advantage to that just based upon the research and what's the disadvantages to that? Through, through you, Chair, the only city in Canada that truly has two separate is the City of Toronto. All the other cities either have an AG or an IA. So, purely speaking, the City of Toronto is the only one with a, a separate person being an Auditor General and a separate function being an IA. I, I, you know, and, and you've done your research, and I don't understand Toronto's, just from my own uh, information, I, I just, upon, you know, your uh, opinion, based upon the research that's been done, what's an advantage to that for Brent, and what's a disadvantage to that, other than the cost is the disadvantage? Like, to me, it would be even more accountability and transparency. I'm just trying to wrap my head yeah. around. I think, to be fair, the City of Toronto, as Joe said, is is beyond my capability of commenting on I, right. because it's just so large and, and, and the amalgamation and the reasons why maybe the legislation said both. In talking to all the other cities, it all comes down to, you know, how do you want to improve your corporation? And some have chosen to go with an AG model, some have chosen to go with an IA. Like Mississauga has an IA model, Windsor has an IA model, they say it works. Um, so. I can't really comment why the City of Toronto was legislated to do that and what the pros and cons are of that. Right. And so, you know, when it, I uh, and I think uh, the cost was $200,000, I believe. How much was the cost? The financial implications? Through you in, in, um, in doing this report, we felt that council would, would go for one, not, the, not both. So you'd have, if you had just an AG model, just an external Auditor General model, like some of the other cities, you wouldn't have an internal audit team. Right. You would actually um, transition into an AG model, right. which would mean you'd have transition costs, and I don't want to get into them in open session, but your IA would not want to be your Auditor General. You'd have a different person. So you'd, you'd have transition costs of about 200K, I, I, you know, from that point of view. So One just, time. yeah, so just, so you know, 150 to 200 thousand dollars. I think if you, uh, I did a quick research. Apologies, I was using my phone. Um, into the um, what the uh, uh, the mayor was uh, speaking about. Um, you know, in one of the in terms of uh, the bids for uh, their roads resurfacing. Um, give me one second. Um, I'd just like so, to remind members of council, sorry, not to intervene, it's 12.38, we have planning at 1 o'clock. Right. So I would just urge the members of council, if they can keep yeah, their I'm comments done. and restrict done. them, so that we can be able to wrap this up. But, but obviously we have the option to prolong after planning if this seems to be right. pertinent. Right, so just, 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 just in, in, in regards to that report, uh, their Auditor General reported on that. Uh, on telltale signs of bid rigging, inflated prices, and uh, says it was a wake-up call to the city. And I think we, two hundred thousand bucks or a couple of hundred thousand more, a few hundred thousand. I think when you're talking about uh, uh, transparency and accountability, I think it's an investment. I think it's a it's a good investment uh, to have a, a, an AG. And you know, we spend millions. I think we just had a conversation on you know IT and security uh, to protect the interests of. You know, you know, data and uh, uh, information within the city. I think you know we invest a lot in that. I think we need to invest in uh, transparency as well and accountability and show uh, you know the taxpayers that uh, uh, we do have a uh, uh, you know uh, you know you know with an AG, it's it, it's it provides that clarity and it provides that uh, reassurance to them that uh, you know we have an independent uh, uh, body coming in and, and, and doing an audit. So. Um, again, I'd, I'd like more information and maybe perhaps more clarification from uh, the mayor of exactly what she's asking for, uh, but uh, generally I do, I do support it. Through Chair, just a couple things is I wanted to be clear, the Budsman report, it stated that, um, it concluded that his investigation did not identify anything that would warrant any formal recommendations. He then later said you might want to consider for suggestions 15 items, which we've closed on 12 of those 15. So it wasn't a pure recommendation from the Ombudsman, it was a suggestion. And Councillor Dillon, I feel that the independence is there with the internal auditor. We 
you know, the new leadership team is promoting accountability and independence, and I, I, I think we've demonstrated that, and I, I think the, the community of Brampton is well served by that. No, and exactly, and, and you know, I've always said, uh, Harry, we do appreciate your leadership. Uh, I think uh, staff has done an excellent job, but I think it's that, uh, um, I use the word reassurance, there's another word I'm looking for as well. It's, uh, uh, it gives uh, our, our, our taxpayers, our residents, uh, uh, that comfort uh, that you know what that we're we're taking all the steps and precautions to make sure that uh, uh, we're handling everything in a in a correct and orderly manner. So, uh, but I uh, appreciate your comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Nord. Councillor Miles. Well, this conversation is to me it's it's getting pretty weird because, in fact, um, and in our internal auditor is pretty well doing the same thing as an attorney, uh, an auditor general. Can can I throw you t to anyone at the table? What makes an auditor general an auditor general? Do they do they earn a special designation, or are they an auditor, or are they a lawyer? <clears throat> the, all of them would have a CIA, which is a Certified Internal Auditor designation. So they would have an audit background. But there's not there's not really any differentiating factors from if you're looking at standards, if you're looking at background, you're not they're pretty much the same. So do you have that certification? I've done external and internal audits from when I came out of university. So if you wanted to be in if you wanted to apply for a position as an auditor general, could you? I could, but I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, this is where I'm going. Is Hamilton has an, in, an internal um, director, and they call that person an auditor general. So we could just call Faruzan the auditor general. She's got all the certifications, and then we would, we would actually achieve both. But... Not independent. Uh, she is independent, and that's the fallacy. And that's where we, we have to make, got to, to make sure that the members of the public and the members of council understand that Ferruzen is independent. She is an independent Auditor General, and by her designation alone, not Auditor General, internal Auditor, her designation requires her to be independent. So. I'm thinking, okay, so if we did support the mayor's motion, we have an internal audit department and all the staff. And they set their work plan and they do whatever they want to do. And then in comes an auditor general. And the auditor general wants to develop their own work plan. So in order for them to develop their work plan, they're going to need a whole, a whole host of staff to work with them because, as we know, um, to do a report like the last Auditor General did, it took hours and hours and hours and resources and staff time and dollars. So the tip of the ice, it's not, it's not a 200,000, you're not just paying for the Auditor General. The whole package, if, it's, if they're a full-time Auditor General, it would be like a du taking your internal audit department and duplicating it for an Auditor General. Is that correct? Like, I'm trying to figure this out. What's the point? The, everybody else across Canada has one, either or. Toronto has two, but Toronto's got lots of issues. So Brampton's ombudsman said, you don't have any issues, you're in the right direction. Even the, attorney, the auditor general, when he first started, he basically said, you've got lots of money in the bank, and you have debt and you need to collect more money um, for infrastructure. That's basically all the attorney, the Auditor General said at the beginning of this term. I mean, that's the fact. We made, and we made changes. So are we going to have a complete internal audit department or, and a complete AG department? That doesn't make any sense to me. It's a total duplication of responsibility and cost. And who says that the Auditor General that we hire is going to be a good Auditor General? We know we have a really good internal Auditor today. The proof is in the pudding. But are we going to, who knows? I mean, any, any internal Auditor 
and I'm not calling you Feruzin any, but Feruzin has all of the qualifications to be an Auditor General. We already have her. So why would we? Okay. Or if the Council says we want our Auditor General, our internal Auditor, to be an Auditor General because an Auditor General has all of these other things under the Act, so let's just make Feruzin an Auditor General. <laughs> Okay. Through you, Thank Chair, you. I just wanted to clarify. I agree with the duplication, but in 7.1.2, um, Section 1, the Auditor Generals are appointed directly by Council for fixed term, and they are generally not employees of the Corporation, so they develop that one more layer. But okay. I definitely agree with you on the duplication. So what? Yeah, so what? So they're not employees of the Corporation. Uh, Thank you. I, th I think, Feruzin, could you clarify for us your independence as an Auditor? What? What you are required as as an auditor in regards to your designation? Uh, I think <clears throat> I think in terms of my designation as a CPA, as well as my designation as a certified forensic investigator, as well as a CISA, each designation and each certification requires me to be to have a certain amount of professional integrity in the work that I do, as well as maintain independence. So would you, in fact, have more credentials than some Auditor Generals? I don't think I want to answer that because I don't, I haven't done enough research to answer that. I think you probably would. Anyway, okay, I just, you know what, if, uh, if we are going to, to consider going in and having both, I would like a really comprehensive look at the cost and the implications to the corporation. It's not $200,000. In fact, it would be more by the time you hire an Auditor General and a team because our team of internal auditors and, the, and their, their roles and functions with the municipality are already adopted and set out by Council. And we cannot have a third party coming in and disrupting um, the, the work plan that we have already identified as a priority based on risks to the corporation. So. We need that. We we can't we can't as a council responsibly just support this and not know what the budget implications are of having a duplicate role because it would have to be a duplicate role. Thank you, Councillor Miles. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to tag on to what Councillor Miles was saying. So, is what makes an auditor general an auditor general the appointment by the province? As to be an as to be an auditor general, or how do you? So I still don't understand how they get to be. You hire them and you call them that. No, I don't think so. They get to get extra powers. Through chair, they're not appointed by the province. They're not. So, so, so the extra powers come from each municipality. Through you, Mr. Chair, the auditor general is a statutory position defined in the municipal act. And if and when or when a municipality appoints one, um, the independence and powers are set out in the Act that are independent of the Municipal Council. There may be scope that Council may define, but the power to act and the accountability uh, for the Auditor General is derived from the Act itself. Okay. So, so it is, it's, it's the Act through the province that gave us. We, so we could appoint, Perusin, she doesn't want to be, we could appoint her an Auditor General and then she gets a, the ability to have those extra powers. Okay, Harry, I, I, I'm confused now because your answer about the, the cost, um, you said it was roughly up to $200,000, but the, you, then you said it was for the transition. The motion, the second motion says to have both. So what would the cost be to have both our internal auditor and the department? Three, and sure. what's the extra cost for to have another? Through your chair, I'd have to investigate. Like, I'd probably look at what the city of Toronto's AG budget would be. I, I didn't do that in this report. I just yeah, felt that you made an assumption we wouldn't have both. There's only one model I, like, like that in Canada, so that's why I wasn't able to. Honestly, I don't think I have enough information here to make a decision on this. I think that we, I need to know what those costs, those extra costs would be. Because, you know, we can talk about being open and transparent, which I think we are and everything right now, but if we don't know what the extra cost is going to be. I, I can't support doing anything right now, so I just spoke, so I can't ask for a deferral to the for committee member, to a committee, but 
I, you know, I think we need some more information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dillon? I just want to respond to a, a couple of comments I heard. I think um, when I heard that this conversation is getting weird, I think this is one of the most valid discussions I've had in, in my three years here. Because we're talking about transparency and accountability. I think there's nothing more important than that. And um, you can get on the board Please, if you want. Uh, if you want, if you want one to has the chair. And I kind of heard also that uh, you know, McCarter's uh, findings were dismissed as you know that's all that he found. But you know, when you're talking about depleted fund, uh, reserve accounts, infrastructure gaps, debt, I think those are huge, major things that he found. And um, um, you know, when it comes to cost, I've seen, you know, uh, you know, it's almost laughable when we talk about costs, when we talk about some of the other costs uh, that uh, the city has incurred by some of the council decisions. Um, so, you know, again, transparency and accountability, I think it's an investment in uh, whether you spend a couple hundred thousand bucks, I think uh, that the value we receive is, is much more. And just a question, uh, Farooz Zah. Frozen. Um, you know, there's almost a question uh, in a comment, but you were hired by, I believe, Harry. Is that correct? Uh, and so I believe you report to, to Harry. No? You don't report to him? Mm -hmm. So what's the, uh, so maybe you can do uh, Sorry, through the chair. We updated the, I believe before I started, Harry had updated the reporting structure so that I report to audit to council through audit committee with just an administrative reporting to Harry. Sorry, could you repeat that? <clears throat> so before I started in September of 2016, right. Harry had changed the structure so that the director of internal audit reported to council through audit committee with just administrative reporting to the CAO. So Harry, if we were to, again, hypothetically uh, go to an AG model, who would choose the AG? It'd be a committee of council, is that correct? Or council as a whole, uh, in the end? Through, through the research I've done, it would be um, council would, would select the So I, I think that's the difference uh, as well in the situation where this is a, a council, ch ch uh, if you go to an AG model, it's somebody chosen by council rather than somebody hired essentially internally. So I think that's uh, something that needs I just to want to correct, though, the charter really strengthened that going forward. The independence, no longer can the CAO just hire a director of internal audit. We were just in that transition. It would have to be all of council with the CAO. So this, the council had hired? No, I'm saying going forward, because we changed the reporting, right. we changed the charter. So in the future, if Feruzan were to leave, Yes. It would be a council, and I would administrate that from an administrative perspective. So going forward, but right now the current uh, internal audit person isn't part of that. Was well, only because she forward. was selected before we changed the charter, but the charter has provided a lot more independence that the CAO can't just no, go hire someone. I understand that, but I'm just what I'm trying to get at is that if you had a uh, uh, external auditor hired by council, uh, I think that's much more uh, transparency. Uh, to uh, the residents and taxpayers of Brampton. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dillon. Uh, Mayor Jeffrey. Uh, on the conversation we've had today, can I ask to defer this issue? Okay. Uh, I think there's more information that could be helpful, and I think what staff came back with was regards to reporting on a permanent and independent Auditor General, and I think what we're talking about, if we decide it, is a fixed term contract. So if we could defer it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councillor Miles. So, uh, sorry. Um, a motion of deferral has been moved, and once a motion has been moved, it's not debatable, and we go to a vote immediately. Okay. So I presume the de the motion of deferral from the mayor the would be part. to the next of uh, this whole item, and we go Just to the next audit committee meeting, which is scheduled for February twentieth, twenty eighteen. Okay. So the deferral is straightforward. Okay, now at this point, no, we'll be deferring it to next committee. And I guess in the meantime, if there's any further inquiries or suggestions that you want to provide the CAO's office uh, to help inform uh, the discussion, uh, um, I think uh, that would be pertinent for, for committee members to do or members of council. 
So staff is not coming back, but we would have to request them. Unless you provide direction, staff's going to only come back. This is deferred to our next uh, committee. So in the meantime, I would encourage any members of council, especially members of the audit committee, if they have any questions or comments that they direct it to sales office for his consideration. So when we uh, rediscuss this item, uh, next audit committee, that will be better prepared to answer some of your questions and concerns. So we don't have to give them direction to bring that back. Unless you want to provide direction. Right now we're dealing with the deferred. Just defer, just defer it. A motion of deferral has been moved. There is. Okay, excuse me, folks. So, so we're going to do a deferral right now. Yeah. Okay. Unless, the, if the deferral loses, then if you want to put a motion for direction, you have that opportunity. But right now we're dealing with the deferral. But in the meantime, like I suggested, yeah. you have every opportunity to provide questions and comments to our CAO regarding this item for next audit committee. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so deferrals on the floor. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you very much. And we go to the next question period. Are there any questions for members of committee? No. Okay. And public question period. Any members in the public like to ask a question? No. Okay. So we are adjourned to the next meeting, February 20th. Uh, motion to adjourn. Councillor Miles. So is this meeting adjourned? This, okay, can I get a motion to adjourn and after we'll consider it? Okay, motion to adjourn. Council Gibson, all in favor? Carried. Thank you.